Thank God as always, uh, my, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for uh, all of the, the grace that I receive on a daily basis. I also want to thank my, my dear friend and colleague, Douglas Faison. Um, uh, Doug is an institution. He really is. Uh, you, you, so much of that $7 billion of spend has to do with Douglas Faison and the great work that he does, the great training that he received from AT&T before he came to the California Public Utilities Commission. And he's become a real driver. And every time I receive one of these acknowledgments, I thank God for Doug, because Doug is like family to me. And I also thank my family who has uh, embraced enormous sacrifices in this journey that I've been in. And without God blessing me with Kim and my three beautiful children, my beautiful granddaughter, I have another granddaughter on the way. Uh, you know, this it makes it all balanced and possible. And but most important, thank you to you. Um, this type of work relies upon your businesses being successful, your businesses being competitive, and you've done that over and over again. You've proven that if given the opportunity, you will outpace the competition. And I want to continue to be a part of that race. So I truly appreciate this recognition. But this recognition would not exist without you. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we continue through our program. Let me reiterate one of the things that uh, this assignment has just stated. You know, uh, when we talk about our small businesses in our community, uh, understand that uh, veteran Southwest Industries is the one that's putting this function on today. And we're putting this on because it's necessary for we, the people of this country, to realize what our responsibility is to the economic and social development of our country, our nation, and our communities. We have got to be stopped standing on the sidelines looking at the dollar that we can put in our personal pockets as our objectives and goals. If we're not doing the collective outreach to economically enhance, improve, and develop our communities, we fail this country. We fail ourselves, we fail our people, and when I say our people, I'm talking about all Americans. We cannot continue down the disastrous road that we have been on of being self-servant and denying other members of the community access to the economic advantages of this nation. So when we talk about good health systems, yes, we need to have health available to every single American in this country. And it's our responsibility to ensure that those services are delivered equitably and evenly for everyone. So this is our wake-up call for us to participate, get involved, seriously, come back to the table and be prepared to put some of your money back into an investment of this country in your community. So, now, for our next keynote speaker, we are prepared to really, really get uh, an earful of information from a gentleman that, uh, uh, as Aubrey would say, he's a homeboy. <laughs> a fellow brother from New York, Brooklyn, all right? Yeah, he knows exactly what we were talking about, because we were talking earlier, and we didn't live that far apart. So, uh, this gentleman is uh, in the Brookings Institute. Very important. He's the president for the West Coast Division, Dr. Lyman. Welcome to the podium, and thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, a couple of quick comments first on just the project before I go into the sort of economic impact. What it would mean for the high desert. Uh, you know, a resident of Las Vegas, I get to read the Las Vegas papers. I get to read the Sunburg Hill. And every time there's a discussion of high-speed rail, there's always this person that writes in and says, but I want the train to go to Anaheim. <laughs> hey, no one's going through the Hong Pass. Okay? The reason isn't some engineering challenge, because there's freight trains going through it continuously. It's that the largest port in the United States lies on the other side of the port, of the pass. The pass is narrow, environmentally fragile, and spoken for. 
No party train from Vegas is going to get through this pass. Period. And then I'll smoke. And grow up. It's not going in. And I've just had it. I've had a belly full of that. Because it, it, it also misses something else, which is the trains and insurance policy for a Sunday night nightmare return trip to California from the Inland Empire. How big is the Inland Empire? It's bigger than Phoenix. So there's this, who's going to drive from Santa Monica? No one. Who's going to drive from Rancho Cucamonga? Lots. Why? You got one Inland Empire airport, and it doesn't go anywhere. It's losing flights to Las, Las Vegas, basically. You know, US Airways pulled out of Las Vegas, and you lost flights. OK. So four and a half, five million people, a half million people living you know, north of the San Gabriels alone in the high desert, and this is who you're using as the base. It's a park and ride. See, I'm from the east. When you say the words park and ride, so let's say you're Fredericksburg, Virginia, Virginia Rail Express, park and ride. Oh, who wants to go to Fredericksburg? No one. It goes to Washington. It's not about going to Fredericksburg to people. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to go down to Victorville and, and, and get like a rental car? No, stay off the train. I don't want to it. It's not for you. It's an intake point for Las Vegas for ground-based access for tourism. And why do we need it? Check out I-15. You think it's so narrow by accident? No. Indian Gaming has worked the California legislature to restrain its expansion as a ground-based link to Las Vegas. Hell, do you know where all the money came for the uphill expansion for the truck only lanes? You can thank Governor Bob Miller from the 1990s in Nevada. He's the one who gave you the money for that. He redirected Nevada's transportation money to California to build those approaches so that you could make traffic flow better. You've got a six lane highway that goes to four, goes up a steep hill at Mountain Pass, then you got this weird ag inspection station with three people working it on a busy weekend. You could have eight hour sojourn returns. You get that once. I've met Californians who want the most jittery person in Las Vegas on an early Sunday afternoon is a Californian. They're freaking out about getting get on the road. They're checking iPhones, they're looking at stuff. This train, you know, who would use this train? Anybody who's been on that trip once and had a disaster of that return trip would consider dumping their car for free into a 15,000 whatever massive garage and check it into a hotel at that thin table. So there's lots of reasons this train would have worked. And I was always thought this was interesting before now. I would have debated this in the public sphere. I would have attempted to have educated Las Vegans as to what a park and ride is. That you need an origin destination and the destination is key. In other words, it is not like the train has to go to A to B. The train could go A and be the intake point for A in the Inland Empire. And the reason you could is that some people gladly drive themselves for a half an hour trip from Fontana over Cumberland Castle, which they're allowed to do, because they're allowed to take their car on I-15, where we're not allowed to take a train through. And go to this place and, and enter a 78-minute ride, a relaxing ride, for, and get some chips for a casino, and get some tie-ins for tourism, get a restaurant coupon, things like that. It's going to be packaged up a million ways. And check in. Sure they would. And the whole idea that the whole South Line is Santa Monica, when five million people live east of the airport, when it's a, a Phoenix-sized metropolis, one of the largest metro areas, a Dallas-sized metropolis east of the airport, and that's big enough as a catchment area to produce demand for a high-speed rail capacity, in other words. So the issue isn't Anaheim, the issue isn't Orange County, the issue is what Marnell understood, which is a lot of the ground-based passengers to Las Vegas come in by auto. All right, with that said, as preface, let's talk about some of the, the value of this. Uh, in direct sense, you know, ever since, by the way, the, the, most people don't realize where the idea of minority subcontracting and contracting came for in federal projects. Remember the Dan Ryan Expressway in Chicago? That was the test case. The Dan Ryan Expressway was built through, uh, you know, right through Chicago's low-income African-American community, uh, Southside of Chicago, and there were zero minority contributions to this project. 